I am going to start by first of all acknowledging the traditional custodians of country throughout Australia and their continuing connection to land, waters and community. And we respect our we pay our respects to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander cultures and to elders past and present. And I'd also like to send our warmest appreciation to all those Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people that join us live today. Welcome to our White Ribbon Australia webinar series. And today we've got a really amazing 60 minutes to kick us off, whether or not um, you're in the morning time or very early morning we welcome you for getting up so early and of course to our guests that are dialing in from new zealand from fiji from right across asia but also north america i know there's been a really lovely demand for this webinar today firstly just some housekeeping we will ask for your utmost attention during this webinar whether or not you're watching it live or replaying it online and please note that the information shared by White Ribbon Australia and from our panellists is for general information purposes and should be not be construed at any time for any legal advice. And for those joining us live, we encourage you to use the chat function. Please be respectful and constructive in the chat and we will get an opportunity at the end to ask some questions. Now, I'm not going to do too much talking, which is wonderful um, because I'm here um, to introduce our amazing guest speaker and for many of you um you might know dr jackson katz he is a long-standing and major figure and thought leader of men working to promote gender equality and women's safety he's the founder of mentors in violence prevention program a best-selling author including one of my favorites the macho paradox his infamous TEDx presentation, I think, Jackson, you told me last night, it's now been watched by 5.5 million people, which is just incredible. And every continent has seen, felt, and been inspired by his influence. I think you're about to conquer Antarctica. I think that's the last continent. And of course, you've worked right across Australia, and that work continues today with White Ribbon Australia. So welcome, Jackson. Um, I'm going to just jump straight into the first question. Um, you emphasise the importance of engaging young men in preventing violence against men's violence against women. You've written and discussed a lot about men and young men as leaders. And right now, mobilising men, particularly young men and boys, um, in this conversation for action is really critical. Could you just start there? Can you begin by just answering the question, where are the male leaders in this conversation and action? Sure, Alan. But first, let me say thank you very much for inviting me to be part of your webinar series and White Ribbon Australia. And I want to say thank you to everybody who, especially people who gotten up so early to because to uh, navigate the time difference. I really appreciate being part of your community broadly understood this morning. I mean, let's be honest, we have a huge problem, right, of men's violence against women. Um, that's in Australia, but it's also all over the world. Obviously, I deal with that here in North America and, uh, and in Europe and other places, but it's a huge problem. And uh, women's leadership has been incredible across you know, all these different categories, multiracial, multiethnic women's leadership, indigenous, indigenous leadership uh, in the majority community. And, and you know, I mean, clearly women's leadership over the past generation or two or three or four, you know, in other words, forever, women's leadership has really been the the driving force behind some of these really positive changes that have been happening in our societies, but really men's leadership has been lacking. And, I, and honestly, I've been saying this for a long time, and this is not a new story and, or a new problem. I mean, the problem of domestic abuse and sexual assault and harassment, these are old, old problems. Um, and women's leadership has been, like I said, great, especially in terms of providing services for victims and survivors and helping to reform laws and change cultural practices that sort of normalize some of these behaviors. I mean, I'll give you one example, and I'll, I'll get exactly to the point about men in a moment, but one, one example in North America, I can't speak to the, uh, the history in Australia on this particular question, but rape within marriage used to be legal. And, and in the United States, as late as the 1980s, it was legal for a man to uh, rape his own wife in the in six different states as late as the 1980s and in the UK it was like i think 1991 or 92 where it was formally uh you know banished from the law that's that we're changing cultural practices that have deep roots in you know western culture and other cultures and 
women's leadership in providing services for victims and survivors and advocating for them and creating programs and 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 reforming the laws has been extraordinary and by the way it's not just been extraordinary and helpful to women it's also been helpful to men and and so much of the conversation that happens in our countries about this work is that somehow women are benefiting and some of those women hate men and men are not seen as part of the solution they're seen as the problem and this is just not I understand that some men feel this way, but this is not really accurate. And I'll give you an example, of, again, a specific example of, of how men and boys have benefited from women's leadership in this field. The, 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 we, we've been talking for the past quarter century about the effects of domestic abuse, domestic violence on children. So all the children who are growing up in homes where their father abuses their mother, their mother's boyfriend abuses their mother, sometimes the mother is the abuser. And this is also true in gay male and lesbian and other uh, social arrangements beyond the heteronormative uh, traditional family. There's an awful lot of kids growing up who are being exposed to domestic violence or domestic abuse. And the term that people use in North America is children who witness domestic violence. Mm. But it's a term that I don't like right and i don't use because if you're a seven-year-old kid cowering in the closet as your father or another man is raging against your mother you're not a witness you're a victim you're not observing something happening to somebody else you're experiencing it happening to yourself well the category of children who are traumatized in this way doesn't include just girls but it's also boys and you have any idea how many boys lives start out as traumatized boys in families who then some of them not all of them by any stretch but some of them end up then taking the path that we give to boys often who have been experiencing this kind of trauma. The, the traditional path is somebody took something from me, I'm gonna go out and take it from somebody else, which is why boys who have been traumatized are something like 10 times more likely to become abusive of others and engage in antisocial behavior. And, so, and, and this, by the way, it's not just boys and young men who are in the system. Like in other words, kids who are locked up for crimes, which by the way, when I was a young man in my 20s, I worked with young boys who had been arrested for crimes, everything short of uh, felony rape uh, and murder. And so many boys and men in the system, including adult men in the prison system, if you do their life history, there's so many of them have family violence, trauma in their childhoods. And the women who are speaking out about all of this and who are organizing around this have been allies to those boys and young men for all these years, rarely getting credit for that. And by the way, there's an awful lot of adult men, including some of the adult men who are probably listening in on this conversation right as we speak, who are now adult men who have childhoods of trauma and violence and who are, you know, have figured out a way to, to, you know, to build lives for themselves, but who are still struggling with relational challenges and sometimes alcohol and drug problems. I mean, it's all connected. All these issues are connected. And women's, women in the field of domestic and sexual violence have been doing an incredible job of all this. But all the time that this has been happening, there's only been a small number of men, and there have been, and, and you know, and I'm one of them, you're one of them, there's, a, there's men on this call, there's a lot of men who are, you know, doing this work. But if you look at the scale of the problem in Australia, or the scale of the problem in North America, or, or anywhere else, and you look at the number of men who have actually taken a stance and publicly spoken up and used their leadership platform, both with individual boys, whether, whether it's in families like it's fathers or uncles or coaches, but also in the public conversation, in media, in, in politics, in you know, religion. In other words, men who have a public platform. So few of those men have really been strong and really public. They might privately support the women who are at the forefront of the work, but they haven't provided enough public leadership. And my argument is we need more leadership from men. And it's not fair. To, we need leadership from young men, too. And I, and I know there's a lot of young men who are listening. And I know young men's leadership is critical and generational change is critical. But I don't think it's fair to put the pressure for the for the leadership for leadership solely on the shoulders of you know young men it's not fair i mean imagine the pressure on young 16 year olds and and 20 year old guys and 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 to 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 like to speak out about domestic and sexual violence and misogynist comments that your friends might be making if they don't see adult men doing it if they don't see adult men in their lives and in the public conversation taking some risks and being strong and being leaders on this subject matter, a lot of them are going to keep it to themselves because they know that they that they may that they know that potentially there's going to be blowback and pushback from their peers. And so I think it's unfair to put the pressure on them if we as adult men don't provide that. So I'm, that's what I'm saying. 
Jackson, I want to just say thank you so much for that opening. And for those that are joining us, um, what a crack away to start um, in a conversation. So welcome. Please continue your comments and your questions in the chat. And for those that are recording this, that are like watching this recording at a later stage, um, be sure to also engage with White Ribbon Australia and um, we can be asking questions anytime. Jackson, um, you speak so powerfully and passionately. You and I have had lots of conversations. Um, and we, um, believe it or not, when you prepare these webinars, you have lots of questions that we already pre-prepare for this, and often they get thrown out of the window. Um, I kind of just wanted to go somewhere because your power and passion is something that really inspires a number of women, men, boys, girls, um, inspires me. Where does your passion come from for this topic area? Well, I appreciate that, Alan. I mean... I started speaking out on these matters when I was 19 years old, which is a long time ago now. And, and I'm honestly doing what I started to do as a 19 year old. When I started looking around, I was one of these young men at the time I was at university. And I was one of these young men, young people who looked around and said and, and looked at the world in a, you know, in a more sophisticated way than I had when I was even younger. And I thought we have so many problems in the world. Right. And I was and one of the problems that I noted pretty early on was was how much violence women had to live with um, at the hands of men, and whether it's sexual violence or domestic violence or the constant fear that women live with of men's violence, like, like out in public. For example, one of the things that really struck me as a young man was when I was a young man away at university, carefree, take, you know, coming home from parties at three o'clock in the morning or four o'clock in the morning and not even worrying about my personal safety. I'm not saying that was smart, but that was normal for guys like me and white guys like me in my generation. And to this day, a lot of men live like that in Australia and in uh, especially white men and in, in other uh, parts of you know North America. And then I had I lived in a co-ed residence hall in my university days and, and I had women uh, across the hall next door, everything. And they had a completely different life. They were constantly worried about where they were going to be, what time it was, how they're going to get home, how safe they were going to be, because they had a palpable fear, especially when it got dark, not all, only then, but especially when it got dark, of being sexually assaulted by men. Uh, and and, and it, it just shaped their life. And I remember thinking, if I were a woman and I had to live like that, I'd be so ticked off about it. And and, and when I saw women speaking out, instead of getting defensive and, and hunkering down in a defensive crouch, I was more like inspired by that. I'm like, these women are standing up for themselves. The ones who are speaking out and organizing are leaders. And I appreciate that. And then I thought, OK, what can I as a man do about this? Because I knew you know, I was a good American football player as a young man. I had a certain you know, confidence as a result. I had a certain stature. And I was thinking. Why, why aren't there more men speaking out about this? Seems obvious that if men are the ones doing most of it, and by the way, most men are good men. Most men are not abusive, mm -hmm. but the vast majority of the abuse is done by men. Why, why aren't there more men speaking out? And, and at the same time, this was all happening for me. I was also, as a white guy, starting to learn about, in a deep way, about racism and colonialism and all these other sort of large historical forces that are at work that shape people's daily lives. And I also happen to be, you know, straight, heterosexual. So I was also at the time taking in this whole sort of the LGB revolution because it, there, there was no T in the LGBT back then. It was the, the we called it the gay rights movement or, or, or gay liberation back in the day when I was, you know, that shows you how old I am. But there was, I was thinking as a, as a, as a straight guy, I was thinking, how would I feel if I had to constantly worry about my safety to be, to be, to be who I am? much less to all the other times kinds of discrimination, right? And I was thinking all of these categories, being a man, being a white person, being he you know heterosexual, I'm in a position of a, some advantage that I didn't earn, but I'm in this position and I have something to say and, and I'm just gonna start saying it. And so I started speaking out, especially in this case about, the, uh, about sexism and about men's violence against women. And as a result of speaking out, I started hearing things from women around me, for example, because you know when guys start speaking out, Sometimes women will confide in them things that they don't tell the average guy. And so I started realizing, oh, my God, so many women that I know have been either victims of sexual violence or domestic or harassment. So many women order their daily life around the threat of violence. So many women don't feel like they're taken seriously for their brains, but they're, it's only you know, about how they look and how they look good, if you will, to, to heterosexual men. And I remember thinking, oh, my God, this is a really big problem. And then as my 
as my work and my and my education expanded, I realized that the issues that I was concerned with, like the, the, these issues of, of sexism and misogyny, were also directly marbled into and connected to every other issue that I found interesting, like racism and colonialism and heterosexism. And then again, I was a young guy who would, with kind of change the world energy. It's like the world is messed up. There's all these big, big, huge problems. And I want to be part of the change. And I, you know, and I came of age, you know, in the in the 20th century, you know, and again, I said, I know some of the young some of the young people in the in the call, that's you know, that's that's so old. And but but at the same time, the 20th century was a time of unbelievable transformation and cataclysmic violence. World War II. I mean, I, my father, who's long deceased, was a was a US Army medic in Germany and France in World War II. I mean, World War. So in other words, it's not that far removed from my generational experience, all these massive shifts that were happening in, in all these movements, social movements, historical movements, and the women's movements, you know, the multicultural women's movements. And then, which started really gathering steam in the 60s, and then the anti-rape movement and the domestic violence movements, which really started gathering steam in the 1970s. All of this was happening when I was, a, you know, when I was coming of age in the early 80s and really coming into my own. All of this was percolating, and I just wanted to be part of it. And I start when I when I realized I didn't have any idea how I was going to make a living in the world or anything like that. It, but it was more like I have to. I just have to use my voice and my whatever skills I have. And along the way, I had so many friends and colleagues and people that I, you know that I, that I connected with um, that it, I get sustained all all along the way. So it, even though it's I'm, I'm I'm I've been at this for a long time, it's like. I, I feel like I'm part of a movement. I know I'm part of a movement. And I know that when I pass from this world, there's going to be hopefully a whole new generation who's going to be taking up the struggle. Well, I am not going to comment on the 20th century age because that might be a career limiting move to say so the least. But one thing that is definitely obvious in when you talk, Jackson, is your passion but also your commitment as a man in terms of leading this space. And it has encouraged and it has inspired individuals like myself. We've never met. You're on the other side of the, the world. Um, but yet that palpable agency that you're deploying every single day to stand up and speak out is infectious. And I wanted to say thank you for that. And I guess when you talk about a 19-year-old kind of at university dreamy-eyed kind of world looking at it um you you share a powerful reflection in your tedx talk um one that profoundly stands out around disrupting the way that we describe men's violence against women by not erasing the concept of men from men's violence against women we have had a awful last month um july was a horrific month for a lot of women um 11 men murdering women allegedly um, across Australia. Um, on average, it's in Australia, they say it's nine, every nine days a woman is murdered by a man or a man murders a woman allegedly every nine days. Um, I don't, I'm not very good at maths. I didn't pass maths, but I can tell you what, that is more than one, one every nine days in July. You talk about language playing a significant role in shaping attitudes and perceptions. How can we um, reframe language to promote gender equality and challenge traditional gender norms. Sure, thank you. And I'm sorry to hear, and I, I know I've been following the news. It's tragic and sad and preventable. So much of it is preventable. It's very sad. Um, and in my country, it's even way worse. I mean, because we have a much bigger country, so there's much, there's tragedy every day, you know? It's pretty, pretty sad and pathetic. Um, well, again, Alan, I think this, a big part of my work as a scholar, in addition to my sort of activist educational work and public speaking, my work, part of my work in, in, in if, if you will, in scholarship has been, has been to help people think about how they think about this subject, because I think we need a conceptual shift. And language is really important to help people think about how they think, you have to help them think about how they use language, right? And so one of the big problems is that most people to this day, to, 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 in 2023, think of domestic and sexual violence as women's issues that good men help out with. And so you'll hear this narrative that we need more men who will help the women out. And my argument is, no, that's not, I don't, I don't accept that. It's like, help the women out? Men are the ones committing most of the violence. 
why, why is it their issue that we're helping them out with? Why isn't it our issue? I mean, is, is racism a, the, the problem of people of color or is it white people? Is colonialism the problem for the uh, colonized nations or is it the colonial powers that have to take responsibility for colonialism? And in other words, I, I think it's a kind of a, a subtle form of victim blaming to say that domestic and sexual abuse are women's issues. I think these are men's issues. I mean, they're everybody's issues, obviously. And by the way, men, women, and people beyond the binary definitions, everybody should be engaged. But in particular, I think we need to say this is this is for men. And then, and then if you want to get even more specific, there's ways that we use language to talk about this subject that keeps us from even having the conversation about engaging and mobilizing men. So for example, People use passive language all the time when they talk about domestic and sexual violence. They'll say, how many women were murdered in Australia um, by their partners last year or last month, rather than how many men murdered women? You know, um, They'll say, how many teenage girls in the uh, you know, Melbourne you know, school district were sexually harassed last year, rather than how many boys sexually harassed girls? Or they'll say mm -hmm. things like, how many... How many teenage girls in New South Wales got pregnant last year, rather than how many men and boys impregnated teenage girls? In each case, the use of passive language, the passive voice, has a very powerful political effect. And the political effect is it shifts the focus off of the group with more power and puts it onto the group with less. And so I think one of the things that we, we and that's not a coincidence, by the way, that's how power works. It's it's through stealth or invisibility and by the shifting of accountability off of itself. So the way that this works to get to get less academic is for us, those of us who want to make visible what has been rendered invisible, those of us who want to engage men, I think we need to have the courage to say honestly that it's men who are doing most of this violence, that that's not anti-male to say, I reject that out of hand, that is ridiculous. And by the way, men's violence against women, um, is connected to men's violence against other men, which is another mm -hmm. huge problem, which is, which is connected to men's violence against themselves, which, you know, suicide is violence turned inward. In, so in other words, all these forms of violence are connected and smart and sophisticated people make those connections. That's one thing. Another thing is that all the women who have been murdered in Australia by their husbands or boyfriends or ex-boyfriends or what have you, and the states and everywhere else, those are, you know how many men are the, the secondary victims? I, you know how many men I know and you know and other people know? Excuse me, how many women? Well, how many men, I'm sorry, that we know who have daughters who have been murdered by their boyfriends, who have friends, who have, who have mothers, I mean, women that they care about. So the idea that somehow something, quote unquote, happening to women is not also happening to men is just not how we live in the world. So, so, th so this idea that there's a men, you know, there's a, it's a women's issue, and it's really about their, it's concern. The concern is theirs. No, it isn't. It's also men's issue, um, both, both as because of perpetration, but also because of victimization. And so, so I think changing the language and being fierce in in being honest about this, and I think this is one of the key things because I think a lot of men and young men can get very defensive about all this subject matter. And maybe some guys are even right now feeling a little like a little defensive. And let me just say, I, I'm not, I don't wanna be self-righteous about this. I have my own issues, you know what I mean? I'm struggling with trying to be a good person all the time and I don't always live up to my own standards. We're all just doing our best. So I'm not saying like I'm some perfectly evolved man and you guys, you know, are all, you know, you know, knuckle draggers, you know what I'm saying? I'm, I'm saying we need to have the, the courage and the, and, the, and the commitment to be honest and to use honest language and then, and then to really get our act together and start having more constructive dialogue, not just dialogue, but constructive dialogue and constructive action. And, and let me just, one last thing, this whole notion of guilt and responsibility and the difference between guilt and responsibility, because so much, so much you'll hear, especially in the States, you'll hear that when white people are dealing with issues of racism or men who are dealing is with issues of sexism, you'll hear, frankly, from the political right, that this is somehow guilt, you know, liberal guilt, it's white guilt, it's male guilt, and we don't want young men to feel ashamed, and we don't want them to feel guilty just for being who they are. I don't feel guilty for being a man. Let me just say that. I was born, this is who I am. I don't feel guilty. I feel responsible as a man. I feel responsible as a man to deal with the world as it is. 
And I feel, not I don't feel guilty as a white person about racism, I feel responsible to work mm -hmm. against racism, or I feel like I'm a hypocrite. Because if I'm a white person who says I believe in justice and fairness and democracy, and I'm not working for racial justice, then I feel like I'm either either a coward or a hypocrite, and I don't want to be that. So, so it's really not about guilt. It's about a sense of responsibility. And I think that's important. And I think, one last thing, I think there's a concept that it's calling in versus calling out. So mm -hmm. instead of calling somebody out for their bad behavior, like saying to a guy, you better stop doing these bad things, I think we need to call them in. We need to say, hey, we need more men. We need more young men who have the courage and the strength and the self-confidence to say and do the right thing. It's not always easy. In fact, it's sometimes really difficult. And one of the reasons why so few men and young men do speak out on these matters is because it is difficult to do. But I think we need to say that the ones who do are actually evidencing courage, strength, and self-confidence. And they're not like soy boy virtue signaling cucks and betas and all this nonsense that you see mm -hmm. online when any, when any man stands up and defends gender justice or racial justice or what have you. It takes actually, if you're a man or a young man, it takes more strength to speak out about these matters than it does to remain silent. And the, being one of the guys, if you're a guy, takes nothing special. It takes nothing special to be one of the guys. What takes something special is when the guys are doing something that's wrong, is turning to them in some way and saying, you know, this is not cool, guys. Mm -hmm. And I don't mean that every intervention has to be in the moment. You have to call somebody, you know, you have to like put somebody on the spot and make them embarrassed. That's not what I'm saying. But I'm saying that going along with the group through action or silence is not something that I would think we should aspire to when the group is acting badly. What we should aspire to is being being one of the guys and one of the, I think, well, one last thing, there is an awful lot of guys, we know this from research, not my own research, but we know that one of the key factors in whether a man or a young man will speak up in the face of misogynist behavior by his peers. And these aren't, not, these aren't just, again, 17 year olds or 23 year olds, this is also 49 year olds. You know. One of the key factors, if not the key factor, in whether he'll speak up around bad behavior relating to one of his male friends or peers is if he thinks other men in the group are also uncomfortable with the behavior. If he thinks he's the only one, he's much less likely to say something mm -hmm. for obvious reasons, because there's strength in numbers. And if, if you feel like you're the only one, sometimes you can feel like you're going to get a lot, you know, a lot of negative pushback. But if you realize that, you know what, there's other guys in the group who are also uncomfortable. They don't know what to do. They don't know what to say. If you realize that, then you're more likely to say something. And part of the reason why we need to spark dialogue among young men and why this needs to be embedded in all in schools from kindergarten on and in universities and in military everywhere, we have to have people talking with each other. And young men and older men need to hear other men talking about this because they'll realize maybe a lot of other, other a lot of other guys actually agree that the status quo is not cool. They just don't want to say something because they don't want to be the first one to say something. Mm -hmm. And that's why the one who says something in the peer group, the one who speaks up, the one who challenges his friend who's treating his girlfriend badly, you know, or you know, verbally abusing his girlfriend or something, or making derogatory comments about women, the one who speaks up is actually a leader. And so we can call it a bystander. We can call, we can say that that's, you know, we're talking about the bystander, but a, an active bystander is, is a synonym for a leader, because a leader is somebody who takes action, even if they might be potentially negative consequences. You have to be smart about it, but the person who takes action, the active bystander, is a leader. Jackson, I just wanted to say, um, when you talk, you, you're talking really about men leaning into their sense of agency and their responsibility to speak up, stand out, but also um, critically um, to look inwardly about what is driving them to either act or not act calling in versus calling out is a really good way of putting it. We're at the halfway mark, team, um, and this is just an incredible conversation. We've put some helplines in the chat. Um, this is this could trigger some responses, so please see 1-800-RESPECT and men's referral line. Those details are in the chat at the moment. I'm going to open up to a question that we've got about eight minutes ago from Mark, and, and it kind of resonated, he must have resonated when you were talking about men's reluctance to speak up about issues due to shame and guilt um, of their own complicity in men's violence against women. Can you maybe reflect on that 
Um, and also, if you can talk to Karen's question, which looks at young people particularly, or young men and about their role, you talked previously about young men not having to hold this weight on their own, that it's actually men like you and I and other men in those adult boots to be leaders. But I wanted to kind of go to that notion firstly of shame and guilt and just explore that a little bit more. And then let's open up a conversation around young men and their role in their agency. Sure. Well, again, I don't think I don't think guilt or shame are motivating emotions. I don't. I think a lot of people retreat when they feel those emotions. They, you know, feeling badly about themselves or, or you know, about what they've done. And and I'm not saying, by the way, sometimes, you know, it's a reasonable thing to feel guilty if you've done something wrong. I mean, so I'm not saying that you always should be absolved of any sort of feelings of guilt. Um, sometimes you you should, you know, I'm sorry I did that. I mean, you could apologize for your behavior. I'm, and again, let's be honest, some of this behavior is really over the top. I mean, we're talking about domestic and sexual violence and really harmful behavior. This isn't just about a little comment made. I'm not, I don't mean to, I shouldn't minimize a little comment, but it's not the same. I mean, so I, I, don't, want, I don't want anybody to think that what I'm saying is minimizing the seriousness of what some people have done and some men have done. But I do think we don't want to get stuck in just feeling like retreating because we're feeling like badly about what who we are or what we've done in some past life or even you know more recently i think we're all on a path in life and i think i think the time to move ahead is right now it's like okay so and and by the way if we're waiting for people in this case if we're waiting for men to be perfect like to have everything figured out and to have a perfect resume of treating you know everybody with respect and dignity never having a sexist thought or a misogynist thought, never acting in a way that you, you feel like, you know, you, that you regret. If we're waiting for that, for the moment that men will start speaking out about this subject, we'll be waiting forever because there's no perfect men. So I think it's the same with racism. I mean, for, for, for white people who are working on issues of racism, to say that they have no racism in their bones, they've never had a racist thought, this is naive. It's just silly mm -hmm. to say, for people to say that. When you grow up in a culture with racism deeply entrenched in the, in the society or sexism or whatever, you're going to imbibe some of that. The question is what you do about it once you've sort of understood it and how you take accountability for it. So I would say to people who have the feeling of like, I'm feeling guilty about what I've done. It's like you have to make restitution to the people you've harmed. I mean, and I can't I can't absolve you. Nobody can absolve you other than the person who has been harmed. In other words, the person to whom the harm was done has the most, you know, has the has the right to say, I absolve you or I forgive you. I don't have that right. I'm not saying that. But I do think as a general principle, I don't think we should let stuff that we've done in the past prevent us from doing something in the present and future, as long as we're willing to own up to our mm -hmm. behavior and then move forward. Um, and about young people and young men, you know, I was a young man once, you know, I, it's, it's, it's getting further and further in the rear view mirror, but I feel young. <laughs> I feel young. Um, it, there's a lot of pressure on young guys. And I know this and I have a, I have a son. I know how much pressure there is on young men. Um, and so I don't want I don't think it's fair to put the pressure on individuals. I mean, individuals can play an important role, but I do think it's unfair to put the pressure on individuals. This has to be understood as a community issue. It has to be understood as a, as a, as a, as a, as a school issue in a sports team, for example. It can't just be an individual on the team that we hope speaks up. It has to be the coaches, the people who run the leagues. Um, they have to be invested in taking this stuff seriously. Um, so that individual boys and young men don't feel like they're the only ones who are being asked to take risks. That's not fair. But I do think also, I would say, Alan, that I do a lot of work in athletics, right? And I've worked with the AFL. It's been a while since I've been uh, working with the AFL, but I, I, I know how important sports is in, in Australia, right? And in the United States and very, basically everywhere. I understand that. But um, the reason why I started my program, the MVP program in the sports culture in back in 1993 was and it became the, the biggest program in professional athletics and in university athletics in the, in the states. The reason I worked in athletics wasn't because of the problem in athletics of men assaulting women, although that that was a problem and it's still a problem. 
my thinking was, where are we going to find more young men who have some status within the larger male peer culture, who have some stature, who have some respect, who can use their voice in a constructive way to begin to open up some space so that other men and young men who don't have as much status can, can speak up. And my thinking was, if you're only working on the margins, if you're only working with the young men who are not in the center of popularity, of, of uh, you know, of, um, you know, of, of cultural power within within like a school or in a community, if you're only working with the kids who are on the, on the margins, you're not going to really change practices. But if you go into the center, you have to you, you, you're going to make transformative change. And my thinking was. What training are we providing? And, and, and I'm talking about adults now. What training are we providing to young people and, and young men, including young men, who are captains, for example, and co-captains of athletic teams? And you know what? We're pre providing practically no training to them. And we know that they have more status than the average kid. So, for example, in the States, in universities and in high schools, there's almost no training for people, young people, who are the captains and co-captains of their athletic teams about how to speak up on these matters, how to challenge and interrupt abusive behavior, what they see going on among their teammates, how to provide mentoring and leadership as an older kid to the younger kids on the team. We just throw them in the situation and we think somehow they're going to figure it out. And I, I think we need we need to change that. But the change doesn't have to happen by the 16 year old. The change has to happen by the 45 year old person who runs the league, the principal of the high school, the, who, 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 whomever the person is who's in charge and who sets the tone, that person needs to step up. And so, so we can help develop the tools for the young people who are in positions already of leadership who, and they can be better leaders. But I have to say one last thing, I have to say, it's not just kids, young people who are already leaders like captains and cap, co-captains of athletic teams or kids who run student organizations or kids who are already involved in mentoring programs. Cause an awful lot of young people in Australia and the US who are already, be, acting as leaders. But I'm saying also, if we talk about leadership as formal and informal, there's an awful lot of kids who aren't in formal positions of leadership who can actually act as leaders, even if they don't have the formal credential. So I'll give you an example. If you're a 16 year old boy and your friend, your guy friend tells a rape joke, if you turn to your friend and say, hey, dude, could you joke about something else? I don't think it's funny. We shouldn't really be joking about this. That 16 year old who just said that to his friend, that's actually a leadership act. He's just mm -hmm. acted. He's executed a leadership protocol. He's understood or identified a problem. The problem is the normalization of something that shouldn't be normalized. I mean, would it be OK to tell a racist joke? I think if you're a white person, would you, should you say something if somebody just told a racist joke? Well, if you're a guy and you turn to your friend and say that's not cool or can you joke about something else, you're doing what a leader does. And by saying it like that, by saying it's not that you're soft or a beta, it's that you're actually a leader and that's positive and aspirational. And so what we're saying to young men is, again, calling them in to be leaders, to be strong, to be you know, young people and young men in this case of integrity who have the guts to say this is not right. Mm. And I think I think a lot of guys know this in their hearts, but 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 knowing it is not enough. Right. Because if you know it and you don't do anything, then what changes? Mm. And there's there, you know, so this is all this kind of stuff that I teach in the, in, in the MVP mentors and violence prevention model. We workshop. It's not just a lecture like me, you know, me coming in and giving a lecture. I mean, we, this this stuff has to be at the level of dialogue and workshop in schools all, all across Australia. And if we're going to really make changes over time in the social conditions that produce all these tragedies, we have to, we have to embed this in normative educational practice and and in schools and in communities and in religious communities and in sports culture and everywhere else and the workplace and everywhere else. And one of the things the White Ribbon Australia does is it focuses on community. It focuses on the notion that we've got to get comfortable with having messy conversations. We talk about place-based, peer-to-peer, persistence, and being pragmatic. And what I took from that conversation or that answer there was the idea that we have to provide some real practical tools to young people and men around how they can stand up and speak out against this, full well knowing that 
at times there's going to be a sense of discomfort. But if discomfort is the price to pay, um, then I reckon it's a price worth paying. Um, we have a lot of young men online. We've got some schools that have got their year 10s, year 11, year 12 students coming in. So welcome. Good morning. Um, you're you're going to have this session, then you're going to go into a full day of classes. So um, pay attention to what Jackson just said then. Like you've got agency, you've got the power and that leadership role can be as simple as saying, I'm not OK with that sexist joke. There's plenty of other things that we can joke about. Toxic masculinity. We have so many questions about toxic masculinity right now, Jackson. I just want to open up there. What are your thoughts on that term, toxic masculinity? Okay. Well, th thank you, Alan. I don't use the term. I don't like the term, and um, I think it's. I think it shuts down conversation with men. And I think if we're if we're trying to engage and mobilize men and young men, leading with something negative, you know, toxicity. You know, we have to take away something from them rather than give them something, you know, I, which I think I, 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 don't, I just don't think it's helpful. I understand what it means. I understand what it means. I, I understand what people are going for when they say it. But I don't I just don't think it's a helpful term. So I, 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 I don't use it. Um, and I write about why I don't why I don't use it. Um, I think we need I need th I think we need more aspirational and positive language about engaging and mobilizing men rather than avoiding toxic behavior we need like encouraging pro-social behavior encouraging leadership encouraging you know anti-sexist leadership or what, what have you that that's more positive and more um and more of an invitation you know like my colleague esther solar here in the states uh says we need to invite not indict young men or men you know we, we need to invite them to be part of the solution rather than indict them as part of the problem. And again, I don't mean to what, you know, to, 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 to dismiss the fact that we do have this crisis. It's an ongoing crisis. And there's an awful lot of men who are participating in abusive behavior that we have to, we have to be clear eyed about, but I do think that there's ways of approaching it that are more likely to be effective than others. And so tox, toxic masculinity is, is not, to my, in my opinion, a constructive uh, contribution to that dialogue. And what I hate about the term toxic masculinity, because I concur, is that it kind of plays into that trope that men are kind of bad. Um, and we know that no man is born bad, right? Um, the nature and nurture debate threw that out of the window in the 90s. Um, what we're asking men to do particularly is that more expansive note, adopt a more expansive notion of masculinity. I think about my dad particularly. My dad is stoic. Um, he's wouldn't you wouldn't say he's a, he's an emotional kind of man, but outwardly anyway. But he he raised my my sister and I. He um, was the first to kind of drive me to my gay therapy. I'm um, in his 1984 Sigma sitting out the back. Um, of the counselling office because he didn't want his son to be alone in the CBD because he cared. So he he can be a full of my, a range of emotions, um, and that's what we're really asking for. So I really appreciate when you say that. We have a question here um, from Annabelle, and I, and I love the question because we ask men particularly to get involved, be active, be a contributor to your community. And the question is, how can men partner with women's organizations to amplify community messaging? Well, one of the one of the ways to do it is with a sense of um, helpfulness and humility and ask them, for example, what do you need? What you know, like it's not their responsibility to figure out for you what you need to do, but it is important for you to know what they need and what they want. I mean, I don't I think men need to take initiative on their own. But but not but not be going in like a bull in a china shop and just like okay we're going to take over without checking in with the women who are already doing the work. So I think one of the things to do if you're a man and want to get involved in this work, other than you know obviously getting in touch with White Ribbon uh, is one way to do it or other organizations, but but also to check in with the women in the community and see what they're doing and then ask them, do you know of initiatives that involve and engage and mobilize men? And if you don't know of those initiatives. Maybe maybe some 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 guys need to take initiative and start those. You know, you know. He, I started the MVP program because I looked around and like there was nothing in the sports culture that I could see and I, or anywhere else that I could see that was doing what I thought needed to be done. So I just did it. And now, now not everybody can do that. Let me just say, not everybody can do that. I appreciate that. But I think 
So the key, the key thing is to check in with the women who are already doing the work and then find out what would be helpful to them and then, and then ask them if they have connections with any other men's organizations in the community that you could then connect with. And if they don't, you should think about if you're, if you're particularly entrepreneurial or particularly assertive or particularly creative, create something yourself. Find some other people who are interested and create something yourself. One other thing I wanted to say, Alan, and I, I, we've mentioned it, you've mentioned it, but I want to I wanna highlight it, is, is, that, is that as white people, and those of us who are white, we have an added responsibility to take initiative to help and support indigenous communities in addressing these issues. And that means financial support, it means legislation, it means personal support, whatever we can do, because I think, I think these are big problems in, in all communities, but they're also big problems in indigenous communities that have, don't have the resources that some of us do in the, in the majority culture, especially among people with means in, you know, in Sydney and Melbourne and you know, all the other you know, big cities, because some of these small communities and some of these indigenous communities don't have the resources, and yet they have big problems. And so I think it's important to talk about that. And I think it's important in, when we do the work, especially those of us who are white, to be humble mm. and know that some of the complexities of race and racism and colonialism make the issues even more complicated for, especially in this case, for members of indigenous communities. And I think a lot of white people, and, and especially in this case, white men, I don't mean exclusively white men, but certainly white men, um, in the face of some of these difficult tensions that exist, their, their default is to retreat and not say or do anything, or just to be very quiet or very, like, I'm supportive, but I'm supportive in private. I don't really want to go there because I don't want to talk about this because I don't want to say something or do something that could be seen as racist or, or, or something. And as a result, I think a lot of people, in this case, white men, remain silent. And I think that that's a failure because I think that a leader is somebody who steps into something and like you said, steps into the discomfort that like, 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 like it's not a horrible thing that you feel uncomfortable. I did a training one time in Melbourne with a group of indigenous male leaders from around the country, from around Australia. And it was fascinating for me and an honor for me. And, you know, the, f the first thing I said in the, in the gathering was, I know that I'm a white guy from the United States coming in here and talking about domestic and sexual violence. And I know that you probably think I have no idea what you're dealing with in your communities. And there's a long history of, of, of colonization and the decimation of the local populations and the alcohol and drug addiction that have decimated our communities. And I, under and I said, I'm not going to say that I understand all that and that I certainly get it on a visceral level because I can't, that, that would be unfair. But I'm saying, I'm here to have a conversation with you. I'm here to share with you what I've been doing and what we've been doing and see if some of the approach that we've been taking can be useful to you. And it's going to be up to you to figure out how to take this and use it or not. But, but just that spirit of humility and, um, and uh, honesty, I think they, you know, I think I, my general impression is that people respect that. And so mm -hmm. you can get through, and, and if I make mistakes, if I say things, or if, if you say things, or other people who are white or, or, or in, from the dominant culture say or do things that, that step on toes a little bit, or make, if you make a mistake, then you say, I'm sorry, okay? I, I, I didn't mean that, I'm, I, I'm gonna take that under advisement, and next time I'll try to do better. But it doesn't mean you retreat. Because retreating mm. gets us nowhere. And I, I think there's an awful lot of men in Australia, for example, who read the newspaper, who see all these murders and this sexual harassment and, and, and all these statistics that come out about all these young women being sexually harassed by boys and men. And they think this is messed up, but they don't really do anything about it other than I'm not going to be part of that problem. I'm not going to harass women. But I, in 2023, saying I'm... It's not my problem because I don't harass or abuse girls and women. It's just a bad argument. It's like, what are you doing in your role as a father, as a coach, as a teacher, as a, as a person in the workplace, as a guy who has mates that you go out and have beers with? What are you doing? What, what, what leadership are you providing in your peer culture? What mentorship are you providing to young men who are navigating? Let me just say the young guys are navigating the social media spaces mm -hmm. where talk about toxicity. There's so much anger and aggression being targeted at women online and in, and in social media and, and especially those young women who have the who have the you know 
the gumption to, to, to speak up and say women matter and, 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 and want to be treated with respect and dignity. So many young guys or older guys like attack them online, I'm talking about, and, and ridicule them and mock them. And it, it, it's so pathetic. So I do think that, that, that we, need, we need to, we need, we need, those of us who are, who are conscious of what's going on can't continue to pretend that it's not our issue and that somehow we're not part of the problem if we don't raise our voice. So much in that. We've got 10 minutes to go. Please keep asking your questions for those that are live right now. Um, Jackson, let's do some quick fire round because I'm really keen to jump where you just ended. Pornography, technology facilitated abuse, social media. What are your insights on how we manage these? Are we is our approach working right now in terms of addressing um, online scourges of harassment, abuse, and disrespect? No, I don't think so. And I think we have a long way to go. And I think the technology is way ahead of our, our ability as a culture, if you will, to address it both educationally and in terms of social norms. The technology is way ahead of those things. I would say, you know, young men, for example, who go to porn, said in this case young heterosexual men i'm not i'm not condemning them for wanting to see you know sex uh, you know vi visually uh, presented um but the impulse to go there is it might be having to do with sexual excitement or desire especially you know young boys you know going through puberty and then afterwards so the desire to go there is not i'm not condemning it what they get when they go there however is not you know, sex and, 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 and reciprocal pleasure and, and sort of something enlightening or enhancing. It's like incredible levels of abuse that men are engaging in against women and men are doing to women, not, not an exchange. It's not an exchange. It's like men are doing something to women and what they're doing to them is often, you know, degrading them and abusing them while they're having sex with them and verbally assaulting them and spitting in their face. I mean, it's so pathetic on so many levels what has become normalized in the porn culture and i'm not i'm not somebody who could anybody could credibly say is anti-sex that's ridiculous i mean i i was doing sex education as a as a college student as a in a peer sexuality education program i don't think this is about suppressing sexual freedom i think this is about is about speaking out about sexualized brutality and violence and so i do think we have I, I think we have to have the courage to say to say out loud we're not going to solve the problems of sexual harassment and sexual violence if we don't address the fact that in the private, so-called private realm of the porn culture, men's sexual violence towards women is completely normalized and eroticized and, and, and a source of men, of, of the turn on, the sexual turn on for, you know, millions, if not billions of young men. And so somehow we're going to, young men are supposed to switch you know, switch gears on one level there, they're having, you know, private pleasure with pornography that is incredibly misogynist and degrading to women. On the other hand, they're going to have real relationships with real women and treat them with real respect. And there's going to be no sort of psychic disconnect. I think that's expecting too much. And also, by the way, I know, I know that these other people have questions, but this Andrew Tate phenomenon, the Andrew mm -hmm. Tate phenomenon is related to the social media piece, which is especially during the pandemic, so many young men ended up getting sort of drawn to Andrew Tate and the, 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 the sort of normalization and the routine or the routinization of incredible levels of misogynist commentary and, and, and sexual objectification of women and degrading commentary about women. And this guy is just completely using young men and young men's vulnerability to basically sell, you know, sell, he's a salesman basically to make a, a ton of money and to, and to, and to become, you know, internationally famous. And what is he giving, what, what is he giving, not just to young girls, I know he's hurting girls and women, but he's also, I think, hurting boys and young men who actually want intimate connection. They actually want relational connection with real girls and, and, and boys and other men, but they're not getting it. If you're going to be immersed in that porn culture, Andrew Tate discourse, you're getting nothing that'll help you to have real relations with real people in the real world. And we, in our uh, in our previous webinar series, we had Chanel Contis and Seb join us and talk about young people, porn and consent and a variety of topics. So I encourage those that are listening to go back onto our YouTube, White Ribbon Australia YouTube channel to check out that hour conversation. 
Jackson, I would love to continue this conversation. I can't believe we're at the five minute mark. If there was one lever that we could pull, and this is, I know, I know, I wish we could pull one lever, but if there was one lever that we could pull right now to shake up and disrupt men's violence against women, what would you suggest that lever be? I think we should have leadership training at all levels of Australian society mandated for everybody who's in a position of institutional leadership, community leadership, school leadership, cultural influence, like religious leaders. It shouldn't, it shouldn't be the ones who just you know, volunteer to go to a training. It needs to be just expected that if you're a leader in Australian society or you're aspiring to be a leader in these various institutions in Australian society, that part of being a leader means addressing all of these issues, not being an expert, but addressing all these issues and then figuring out how you as a leader can make a difference within your sphere of influence. Um, and, and by making it a leadership issue and mandate, you're going to get an awful lot of men and young men who would never voluntarily show up at a white ribbon meeting or they would show up for a webinar voluntarily. But you're not saying that it's voluntary. You're saying that part of being a leader is you have to have this set of skills. In the 21st century, if you don't have those skills, you're not being a good leader. I think if we can get to that place where it becomes normalized, that that's part of the leadership um, uh, mandate, then the kind of conversations that we're having right now will become much more routine because leaders are the ones who set the tone within organizations. They're the ones who set the schedule, the agenda, the, you know, what gets said and what, you know, what doesn't, they bring people together. So I would say, I think any man in the, in the, who's hearing this, who's in a position of influence and person, not just man, but any person who's in a position of influence needs to figure out if they're in a position of leadership in some way, how they can uh, make this happen. I also want to say, Alan, because it's really uh, time, timely, and I know we're running out of time. Um, the Barbie movie, I just finished writing a big article about Ken mm. and the Ken storyline in Barbie and how much the Barbie movie's huge global success is creating space, it's opening up space for a more thoughtful conversation about, about gender, about masculinity, about men, as well as about, of course, women, and, and a Barbie is a woman, but, I mean, it's stand-in for women, but Ken and Ken's narrative of, you know, of, of feeling like only, only being, you know, taken seriously when Barbie notices him and then he goes to the real world. I know I'm giving spo a spoiler alert. I'm giving away something. But when he goes to the <laughs> real world and, and understands that patriarchy, in other words, men are in control in the real world, and he brings that back to Barbie land and it doesn't go well. <laughs> it's like at least the story of Ken within the Barbie story gives us the opportunity to talk about how many men are struggling with these kind of questions? What does it mean to be a man in the 21st mm -hmm. century? And by the way, in, in the United States, opening weekend, 35% of the people who attended that record-breaking weekend, 35% of the theater goers were men. So in other words, I think a lot of men want to have this conversation across race, class, sexual orientation, and identity. I think a lot of men want to have the conversation, but, but back to the leadership piece, those of us who are in positions of leadership need to create the context for that kind of conversation and that kind of dialogue. I don't know how we got to a 60 minute mark, Jackson. And I love the fact that we ended on the role that we could do is in terms of leadership um, and men right across Australia. And I don't have a creative bone in my body for those watching and for those that know me, I'm not creative at all, but I'm gonna call it invite, not indict, or play around with those terminology. And I love the fact that we kind of somehow weaved into this conversation, Ken and Barbie. Um, I tell you what, Jackson, um, I know from the comments, the questions before this webinar, but also during the webinar, and I know after this webinar, um, you certainly have a role um, in the Australian landscape and zeitgeist. And I know that White Ribbon Australia and you are going to continue to work together um, over the next 12 months very strongly to ensure that we continue these conversations. But can I just say on behalf of White Ribbon Australia and on behalf of the audience watching or re-watching this recording, Thank you so much um, for taking the time um, to come out um, or wake up or go go to bed late. I'm not quite sure what the time there is in Boston, but I do know for us that if anybody is listening right now, use this as an opportunity to do something, go out and show that leadership that Jackson, that Jackson just shared so passionately with us. 
Thank you so much, everybody that dialed in, and Jackson in particular, thank you so much for your insights today. Thank you, Alan. I really appreciate it, and thanks to everybody for participating, for listening, and uh, hopefully we'll go forward together. Thank you. See you later. See you later.